who shall do exploits. And God, we're asking you to send your holy angels to fight the spiritual battle against the fallen angel Lucifer himself. And we thank you and we praise you, Lord. Break the atmosphere in this place of noncompliance. Break the atmosphere of, of, in this place of stubbornness. Break the, break the atmosphere of an unteachable spirit in this place. In the name of Jesus. And let your power flow once again as it did 2,000 years ago when you told your church to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. God, we pray for every believer that's watching by Facebook this morning. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that every sickness be healed, that every demonic stronghold be loosed in Jesus' name. And we thank you and we praise you, almighty God, for all that are here today and all that are watching and all those who will tune in. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Give the Lord a good clap offering this morning, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to share with you today my message, what is the church? What is the church? But before we can understand and even possibly grasp the concept of what the church is, we have to understand what the church is not. I want to start there for a moment. What the church is not. The church is not... A social club. The church is not a place where you come to hear a message and you go home the same way as when you came in. The church is not a place for you to come to sing the songs and to lift your hands. And praise and enter into a courtship with the Lord Jesus Christ. To come to a place of commonality and worship to the Holy One of Israel. And then leave here and live like the devil. The church is not a place... For complacency. The church is not a place to have an unteachable spirit. The church is not a place for you just to come to alleviate your guilt. The church is not a place that you should come just to come. So what is the church? The word church in the Greek is from the Greek word ecclesia. Called out ones. That's what the church means. It means there are people who have been called out. But called out from where? Is the question. And called out from where? To where? You have been called out from one place and called into another place. You are never called to the place of stagnation. You are never called to a place of non-attendance. You are never called to a place of inoperable, just sitting there, stagnated, idle, doing nothing. So what is the church? Is it the programs that we have or we don't have? 
Is it a place just to have friends? To meet boyfriends, to meet girlfriends? I feel that the church at large today has truly lost its identity. And the reason why the church has lost its identity is because the church today at large is more like the world than what the church is supposed to be. What is the church supposed to be? In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to ask you to use the Holman edition translation. Ephesians chapter 5. Starting with verse 21. The Bible says, submitting one to another in the fear of Christ. So the first characteristic we see in the church should be a church of willful submission to one another. Another one, in other words, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, is not one who is self-centered, all centered around themselves in the decision making. Hello? But they should be conclusive in submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. The next verse says, wives, you don't like this word, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's, that's almost a counterproductive word today, submit. We have more of an independent spirit in the church. And you hear women say, well, pastor, you don't know my husband. But God does. And if you are lining yourself up into the place where you're obedient to God through the scripture, God will deal with your husband. <laughs> How God won't deal with your husband is if you are not obeying the scripture. If you aren't obeying. Not so much he's not obeying. Because the Bible says in 1 Peter. Wives. Submit to your own husbands. And when you do. You treat them right. And it says you will win them without a word. By your actions. But that's not where I'm going. I'm not going with husband-woman relationship because this is, this is going to tie itself in. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. And sometimes one of the problems in many homes is you have a two-headed monster. You have people with two heads. This head is clashing with this other head. And so what begins to happen is there's indecision. Then comes manipulation. I'll get my way by saying this or withholding that. But he said the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is head. Of the church. 
So if the wife is to submit to the husband, then logically we must submit ourselves to Christ. So quiet in here. Is this Episcopalian church or Pentecostal? We don't hear too many amens. Maybe because we should be this some saying, oh me. Instead of amen. As also Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. Next verse. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so the wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Look at that. Go to uh, 527. Now, he did this to present the church to himself. Could you put that in King James? I like the way that King James phrases that. That he, meaning Christ, might present it to himself, a what? A defeated church. Huh? Are you paying attention? A stagnant church. An uncooperative church. A church doing the individual individuality decisions. Huh? So that he may present himself a what? A glorious church. Not having what? Spot or wrinkle. So what happens when you have a piece of clothing, a nice piece of clothing you went out and you purchased, and you're eating, and like my wife many times, will end up getting a spot on her clothing. We even today have tied pens. As soon as we get a spot, we take it and we, that's my favorite shirt. We want that spot out. Why? Why do we want that spot out of our favorite clothing? Because it's a flaw. It's something other people will see. So he's coming for a church without spot. So that means that the reflection of that church has to be right with God. How about without wrinkle? Now I know some wives, they don't care what their husbands look like when they leave the house. But I know there are some women, like my wife, if I had a shirt on that was all wrinkled, she would say to me, you're not wearing that outside. She says, take that shirt off. Now, that's not the time for the male ego to say, what are you talking about? I'm the man. You're going to listen to me. I'm going out there. No. There's a time you submit one to another. And I say, okay, honey, I'll take it off. And, and she'll say, well, here, you either iron it or I'll iron it for you. So as she takes the shirt and she begins to take the wrinkles out, what happens? It's nice and smooth, right? It's presentable. She hands it back to me. I put the shirt on, and it's nice. The same way, Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. But here's the problem. He's not dealing with laundry. He's dealing with people's attitudes. Some of us have some spot and wrinkle in our attitudes. Oh, I don't need church. I don't need prayer. 
Don't need Bible study. Don't need it. You know what happens? You become religious. I've been in this 40 years. Nothing surprises me. So what does a biblical church do? It's a place where we gather together because we are the body of Christ. Amen? We're a part of a living organism, not an organization. Were you able to get that video for me, Bobby? Can you play that video that Bobby gave you? This is on our website, by the way. What is the church? Is the church a building? Is the church a pastor? Or the staff? Is the church the music? the tradition or the ministries. These are all good things, but they are not the church. Take them away and the church is still here. Why? Because you are still here. The church is you. The church is you with a purpose. The church is you on a mission. The church is you with a plan, a simple plan to plug into God at a weekend service, to charge up in a small group community, to live out using your gifts and passions, and to pass on your faith to those who do not know Christ. When you and I live like this, all the things we used to do in church become things we do as the church. God desires it. The world needs it. And we are called to be it. What is the church? The church is you. That's who the church is. It's not 651 Orchard Street. This is a place we assemble together. And the Bible says in Hebrews, forsake not, say it with me, forsake not the what? assembling of yourselves together, especially as you see what? The day approaching. What day? The coming of Jesus. As often as the doors are open, and I want you to understand, there are people in foreign nations right now the persecution in China is unbearable. They're killing Christians, burning churches, closing churches. They cannot go to church anymore. I saw when one village got Bibles, Chinese Bibles. When they brought the Bibles at the altar, the people were running from the congregation, running, tears streaming down their face. I need a Bible. I want a Bible. And they were taking the Bible and they were kissing it because they are so hungry for the things of God. But yet in America, we have 20 Bibles in our, in our possession and we very seldom read one. They wish they could come to a service like this on a Sunday. They wish they could come on a Monday night prayer freely to a service. They wish they could come to a Bible study on Wednesday freely, but they can't.
Can I tell you that may happen in America? So we need to get what we can while we can. Of course, we celebrate the Lord's table. The biblical church is led by qualified elders. Titus 1, starting with verse 5. Qualified elders. Everyone wants to be a teacher. Everyone wants to be a leader. You'd be surprised how many young Christians come up to me and tell me, oh, I believe this, I believe that. And the moment I question them, they have no foundation to what they believe. They have no foundation of understanding because they never had a good, solid, biblical teaching of doctrine. Paul says, for this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I has appointed thee. Next verse. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Just go to the next scripture when I finish. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine. Can I tell you, so many churches don't want to preach doctrine anymore. I heard a brother once say, we don't need doctrine. I said, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. How can you say we don't need doctrine? That's like trying to get milk without a cow. Holding fast the faithful word. Do you know what it means to hold something fast? I'll give you an example. Jen's hanging on a cliff. Give me a hand. And I'm holding. I'm holding fast. I am not letting her go. I refuse to let her die. And I'm going to hold fast as hard as I can so she will not get away. But you do that with the word. That has to be a part of you. It's not just holding your Bible in your hand. It's holding the Bible in your heart. Amen. Holding fast the faithful word. It's a faithful word. It's a proven word. God has proven it time and time again to you and I. It's a faithful word. That's what I have to do. I have to hold fast. I can't let go. Amen. Someone called me and said, pa Pastor, I want to come back to the church. And I promised this and I promised that and I promised this. I said, well, God told me to tell you this. They said, what's that? 
I said, remember Ananias and Sapphira. It's better to not make a vow than to make a vow and not pay it. Ecclesiastes. But God is not that way where you make a vow and you don't pay that vow. He says, don't do it hastily. And I told this person that. I said, so now what I want you to do is you pray and wait till Friday night, Friday afternoon. You call me if you want to come. I didn't receive the call. Why do we think this is not serious business? Do you understand the thousands and thousands of people who once knew Christ and turned their back on Christ are now living in eternal torment forever and ever? There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. They are living a Christless eternity on their decision. Someone wrote, I don't know who it was, somebody wrote something on Facebook about a man, uh, and he had his phone on in church, and uh, it went off. And the pastor scolded him, the elders scolded him. He went home, his wife scolded him. And so from that day on, he never went back to church again. He went into a bar room, and the bar room started giving him all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, affirmation, oh, that's terrible. You, there's nothing wrong with that. Blah. Started to affirm him. So now he went to the bar. And he used as an excuse the pastor and the people in the church and his wife for bringing correction to him. And I wrote back, and they said, and well, the whole, ch the whole gist of that was, so don't judge somebody. No! Can I tell you, it wasn't the pastor, it wasn't the people, it wasn't his wife. It was his commitment. Because he didn't have to go to a bar room. He could have gone to another church. He didn't have to go to a bar. But there's something in man, hallelujah, there's something in man that doesn't want to serve God. In this flesh dwells no good thing. And the moment we can find an excuse for anything, we will lean to that excuse. We will take that excuse. And we'll blame everybody and anything else. Except themselves. Holding fast the faithful word. Let me tell you something that's not popular. You will not win friends and influence people. It's not very popular. And the preachers that preach this are branded too stiff. They're too serious. My son Sam from Nigeria is supposed to be coming back soon. He said, Daddy. He's 38 years old. He calls me Daddy. He says, when I was in Alabama, he says, I was looking for a church. And so he went to this place I think it was a restaurant or something. There was believers there. And he asked them, he said, are you believers? They said, yeah, we're believers. He says, can you give me three churches that I could visit? And they named three churches. And they said, but go to the first two. You might find something. But the third one, don't go there. The pastor's too strict. He, and you know how the Nigerians are, he saw strict I've been to Nigeria six times I love Nigeria and they said don't go to that church he's too strict 
So he went to the first church. He came out too liberal. Went to the second church. Extra liberal. And he went to the third church. And God said, you're home, son. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able, by giving you a free gift when you walk through the door, handing you coffee and donuts, patronizing you, giving you gifts, telling you how wonderful you are, <laughs> how you can do anything. For your purpose and your destiny. No. That he may be able by what? Sound doctrine. Both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. You know what the gainsayers are? Those who will not allow anyone to tell them anything. I'm telling you, there's people in this church too, I believe it, that they hear what I'm saying, they hear what I'm saying, and they'll walk out that door and they'll do exactly what they want to do. And their theology and their thinking is, no one's going to tell me what to do. Mainly that happens because of people being hurt in their life. No one's going to tell me nothing. I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, go ahead and do what you want to do. Then you suffer the consequences when they come. Thank you. I got one amen. But I don't want you calling me and asking me what color shoes you should wear. Or if you should dye your hair. What color clothes you should wear? I don't want to know that. That's your business. But when it comes to the church business, you need to have ears to hear what God's Spirit says. Can I get an amen? Led by qualified elders. The biblical church worships in song, and they worship together. They sing in the spirit, and they also sing in the native language. I don't think I'm going to get through half of this. A biblical church also maintains corporate holiness through church discipline. Let's look at Matthew 18, verse 17 for a moment. Can we go back a couple of scriptures? Let's go back a couple and see what happens. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now go to the next one. But if he will not hear you, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it where? Tell it where? Come on, say it louder. Can I get a, a little more cooperation? Come on. Tell it to the church. Who's the church? The building? No. Tell it to the believer. I thought, I thought we're not supposed to judge. Hello? Tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a... What's a heathen? What's a heathen? Huh? A sinner, unsaved person. 
a heathen man and a publican. Verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever shall loose be, on heaven shall be loose. Go next verse. Go to the next verse. Go to the next verse. I, I don't have all of this, so. Okay, no, it's not there. But the, the, the crux of the matter is, is that after he does not listen to the whole church, you're supposed to tell him to leave the church. Oh, pastor, how are they going to know? Well, no, 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 no. Don't go by emotions. When you use this discipline, and I've seen it work, when you do this discipline for people and you tell them they have to leave the church, you love them, you're going to pray for them, you want to see them restored, but they need to repent. Because what happens is a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you allow people to continually say, take drugs, Monday through Friday, come on, and Saturday, come on Sunday morning, lift their hands, praise Jesus, go home, live like the devil all week, go to nightclubs, get drunk, uh, pass out their bodies to everybody, having uh, sexual relationships out of marriage, and you allow that to continue on in the body, what do you think the rest of the body is going to think? The rest of the body is going to say, well, pastor thinks that, that that's okay. Huh? And so what, what does that breed? That breeds a people that will begin to compromise and say, well, I'm lonely. I need a person. And they'll go out and get an unsaved person. And they'll develop a relationship with that unsaved person, even to the point of having a, a, a sexual union with that person. And then come into church and, ah, take you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. You don't love nobody. You don't love Jesus. He said, if you love me, obey my commandments. And yet, you know, you do it secretly and you think God don't see it. Come on, somebody. I'm talking to somebody. They'll even skip church. We had such a person on fire for God, coming on all the services, on fire for Jesus. And then their work took over. Hello? Not you. But their work took over. And, oh, I have to work late tonight. Then again, I got to work late again tonight. Can't come. Can't come to the men's meetings, breakfasts. Can't do that no more. Then started missing Sunday morning. Came for advice. I'm, I just want to tell you something ahead of time. Do me a favor, please, as your pastor. If you come to me with advice and your mind is already made up, don't come. Because you're not open. And you're going to waste my time and your time. Because you're going to do what you want to do. However, if you're open to hear, Now, wouldn't it be crazy? Think about this, right? Wouldn't it be crazy? How many love football? I love football. Come on, don't, don't, don't be lying in church. You love football. You watch football all the time. Patriots love it. got Patriots shirts. And Come on, some of, you are, some of you are sports fans. Come on. It's all right. God understands. God's a Patriot fan. <laughs> but how would it be if the Patriots had referees that were all on Kraft's payroll. 
and was getting paid by the patriots. That would be unfair. You have to have someone who's impartial. Right? You need someone impartial because all the time they'll be throwing the flag for the other team. Oh, a 15-yard penalty holding. Oh, you know, give the Patriots the advantage. So you need someone impartial. That's what a pastor is. When I do marriage counseling, you know, especially if I know the couple, and see, they begin to think, well, I ain't going to him because, you know, he's impartial. He loves you more than he loves me. No, I don't. You know what I love more than both of you? The Word of God. Word of God. And I'm going to stand behind the Word. I'll give you the Word. And if it happens to fall in the lap of the wife, that she's wrong, so be it. If it happens to fall in the husband's lap, so be it. If it happens to fall in both of their laps, so be it. What is the church? Acts 2.47. Is this helping anybody? I hope so. The church was praising God and having disfavor with all the people. Is that what it says? What does it say? They were having favor with all the people. Can I tell you something? Here's what some people think. If I go out and evangelize, tell people about Jesus, they're going to they're gonna walk away, reject me. They're not going to want to hear what I They don't want to hear what I got to say. You know, they're going to just walk away. And, you know, the people are mean today. You can't even drive your car without people throwing the bird at you and all kinds of things. I ain't going to go tell people about Jesus. Well, if you go out with that attitude, some people say, well, I'm not driving my car. I might get a flat. Then what good is it having a car if you never drive it? Uh, I'm, I'm scared to get a flat. That's dumb. If you get a flat, Fix it. But if you go out with an attitude of defeatism already, oh boy, if I go out there, I know people are going to dislike me. They're not going to like me. They don't want to hang around with me no more. Oh, they're going to think I'm a nut. Oh, you go out with that attitude, guess what? You ain't getting nobody. If you go out there all sad and looking looking like, you know, you just ate 16 prunes. Excuse me. Can I tell you about Jesus? Well, what do you want to tell me about Jesus? Oh, you know, Jesus, man, he loves you. It's a rough life, but he loves you. You know what they're going to say? Get out of my face! And I'm not telling you to act. I'm telling you to be. Christians need to be joyous. One of the fruits of the Spirit, is the first one I believe it is in the, in the Scriptures, is joy. You have joy? Huh? Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Can I tell you about what he's done in my life? I, tell you, I was a heathen sinner, and God changed me. I walked around with doubt and fear, and I hated, you know, even the thought of, of knowing religion and all that stuff until one day Jesus touched me. You, you, you don't go to people and say, hey, you know what? If you, if you serve Jesus, he's going to give you $1,000, a new car, a new house. You know, who wouldn't? Right? She'd be crazy to say no. Somebody came to me and said, you want to serve Jesus? I'll give you a brand new car and all this. I said, yeah, give me a hallelujah. I'm going. But the seed would be on the 
rocky ground. He said that you'll have favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily. Whew. Are you adding? Come on. Are you adding? Are you excited about for his glory, Christian assembly? Are you excited about what God's doing? Are you excited about what he's doing in your life? What's he doing in your life? Well, he gave me a cracker the other day. Cracker. Well, if that's all he gave you, then, you know, instead of saying, oh, well, he gave me a cracker. Say, praise God, I got a cracker. I had nothing, but now I got a cracker. No, oh, he gave me a cracker. Some people don't know how good they have it till they lose it. Try being in a third world country and you have no food. You can't eat the food. The food is so hot, and I mean spicy hot, that it actually causes blisters on the inside of the roof of your mouth. That's how hot the food is, worse than ha uh, Haiti. I had to call my wife up. I said, honey, <laughs> I can't talk because my mouth is burning. You got to send me peanut butter. <laughs> and she FedExed me peanut butter and crackers. It only took about four days. Federal Express, that was the most expensive peanut. It was $89. And I was thankful for peanut butter and crackers. You know, you all, you all go to your, you just put some peanut butter crackers and just eat it. Every time I, I look at peanut butter, I go, oh, peanut butter. I love peanut butter. Because it reminds me of when I had nothing. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 11, 12, you don't have to go there. I'll just read it. It says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the edifying of the body, for the church. There's no other foundation that a man can lay than which is laid is Christ Jesus. Acts 9.31 says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Gal Galilee and Samaria, and they were edified. Church was edified. You cannot be edified unless you are sanctified. You need to be sanctified in order to be edified. Because if you're, not, if you're trying to get edified and you're not living sanctified, guess what? What's the church? What's the purpose of the church? Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world. Can I tell you, I wish a lot of newfound churches today would read this scripture. The church today is trying to be so conformed to the world to win the world. They're not winning the world. They just have a bunch of people sitting in the pew, sitting in the chair, not even converted. I tell you, I have a cousin in Texas, goes to one of the largest churches, and it's not Joel Osteen, by the way, 25,000 member church, okay? Got back in contact with her, talked with her, said, hey, it's good to hear from you. And she says, yeah, I'm going to this church. And I said, well, that's wonderful. I said, she said, I'm a Christian. I said, that's wonderful. You're a Christian. I said, are you born again? And she wrote back, what's that? Hello? What's that? You've been in the church for two years, and you don't know what being born again is? No, because she equates Christianity with, the ch with going to church. Going to a church. So is she converted? No. If you, don't know, if, you're, if you haven't been born again, you're not converted. And if you're not converted, guess what? You're not going to heaven. You've got to be converted. That's why Jesus came. 
Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable. Acceptable. I'm sorry, don't, I want to add to the word. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. First Timothy 4.13, Paul says to Timothy, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now comes your pot. Come on, say my pot. <clears throat> now concerning spiritual gifts. Brethren, who's the brethren? You. Brethren is all inclusive with women too. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you what? Ignorant. Ever have anyone tell you you're ignorant? You know what that means? It just means a lack of knowledge. You're ignorant. We think we just means nasty. You know, no. It means you just don't, you lack knowledge about something. Unless you know everything about everything. And I know there's a few people in this world that think that. They know everything. And it usually starts at the age of 16. <laughs> but they got a rude awakening coming when they get out in that world. I'll never forget this guy that I worked with, a Titleist. He graduated high school, you know. And his dad says, son, I'm so proud of you. You made it through high school. And he says, I got a, I, I, he says, I, I waited to the last minute, but I gave, I'm going to give you the best present you ever had. And he's like, oh, boy. You know? And he says, come with me. And he starts walking toward the driveway in the front door. And he opens the door. And he goes, oh, my dad bought me a car. My daddy bought me a car. And he. He opened the door, and he looked, there was nothing there. And he said, Dad, I don't see anything. He said, oh, no, son, see? See, you graduated high school now, but there's a whole big world waiting for you out there of plenty of opportunity for you to go and make something of yourself. And so that's what I'm giving you now, the opportunity. You've got a few more weeks before you have to get out and get your own apartment. Oh, no, no, no. I I'm going to keep my little son and daughter home. Excuse me? You're not letting them grow. I'm going to keep my plant right here. I'm not letting my plant grow. Uh, Mom, Dad, guess what? I'm going to school in, in Alabama. You ain't going to no school in Alabama. You're going to stay right here. How are they going to grow? Hello? Unless your kids are stupid. and You can't trust them. You've got to let them go. You've got to let them grow. And somehow, you know, when the, the nest is empty, now you've got this big old house. And you say, you know what, we need to downsize. And you're going to sell your home. Here's a word of wisdom for you. Always have an extra bedroom because they will come back someday. Always keep one bedroom because someday they may come back again. Now concerning spiritual gifts, say spiritual. I'm not talking about the natural gifts. Can I tell you, every single person in this assembly and those that are watching by Facebook right now, 
You have spiritual gifts that God has given you that you've just laid by the wayside and you haven't used your gift. You just, you, you, what you did is just put it back under the tree and left it there. You all have spiritual gifts that you need to exercise those gifts. That's what the church is all about. Next verse, please. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto this dumb idols before, even as you were led. Come, just keep going. And wherefore I gave you understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, I believe the Monday before we stop prayer because of Christmas. We had a great prayer meeting. Monday night was good. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord came on me because he has given me a gift of knowledge at times. Supernatural gift, not a natural gift. I didn't learn this in school. And after prayer was over, we were, you know, we were just standing around. And I just felt led to go over to Jan uh, Jeanette. And I put my arms on her and I said, God told me to tell you that your shoulders aren't big enough to carry this load. And she just began to weep. And she said, I needed that. I needed that. At that moment, I needed it. That's what God knows. You have gifts. I was preaching at Pastor John's church. And the man, they all came up for prayer after the man came up. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, he has an estranged son. Never met the man before in my life. Don't know his life. Don't know what he's going through or anything like that. He came up for prayer. He didn't say a word. And I said, and the Spirit of the Lord said to me, you have an estranged son. Estranged son. And he put his head down. And he said, yes, I do. I said, God wants to heal that. And whatever you can do on your part, do it. And I prayed for him. How do I know that? I don't, I'm not a psychic. No, no, no. We don't believe in that. But God gives words of knowledge to people. But there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Next verse. And there are differences of administrations. Sometimes God will have me go and lay hands on somebody. Sometimes God will just have me speak a word. Sometimes it's, it's different administration sometimes. Now, I don't recommend this. Okay. Now, Brother Diamond, he's used in different administration. Okay. There was a girl that was born blind in one eye since she was, since she was born. Couldn't see out of it. Had all this milky film all over her eye. She couldn't see out of the eye at all. And she was in one of David Diamond's service. And you're going to meet him. He's going to come in maybe February, I guess. He was in a service, and he had a prayer line. And they came up for prayer. And he said to the mother, what, what would you like? She was, she was uh, 14, I think, 13, something like that, whatever, how old she was. And she said, I want, I want God to heal my little girl's eye so she can see. He said, okay. Now, you know Brother Diamond. Nicknamed Crazy Man. Because he'll do anything the Lord tells him. So the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Different administration. Now, understand this. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. Can I, can I tell you something? Jesus moved in that kind of administration. Jesus stooped down one day, took a bunch of mud and stuck it in somebody's eye. Come on. Jesus told a man, he says, go, go wash in there and you'll be healed. Different administration. So the Holy Spirit spoke to Brother David and he said, ma'am, he says, do you believe that God speaks through me? He said, yes, yes, Pastor David, I do. Will you let me do what God is telling me to do? And if you do, God will heal your little girl. She said, okay, pastor, what does he want you to do? 
I'll tell you next week. <laughs> no, no, I'll tell you. He said, God told me to spit in your, her, her eye. Now, you got to understand David Diamond, he kind of, kind of theatric, you know, a little bit. He said, so I got some deep stuff, you know. <laughs> He said, now hold her eye, but eyelid wide open like this. And he went up to her and he went. <laughs> and she began to wipe that. They gave her a thing and she began to wipe it. And as she was wiping, she began to shake. She said, Mama, Mama, I can see Mama. I can see, Mama. Mama, I, I can see. Mama, I can see. My eyes heal. I can see. <laughs> Difference of administrations, but the same Lord. Now, don't go practicing kicking people and knocking people in the head and stuff like that. See if it works. Next verse, next verse, next verse. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. Next verse. I'm trying to hurry so we can finish. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. Say every man. Does that include you? Huh? Does that include you, brother? That's right, it does. To what? Profit with them. That doesn't mean you go and make a stand and say, okay, you want to be healed? 50 cents, please. That's not the kind of profit it's talking about. Give it to every man to profit with it. In other words, to be successful in the operation or manifestation of that gift. Grandma, you have a gift. Well, I'm retired. I'm 86, 87. Have yeah, you got the gift of time? You could pick up that phone and just dial any number you want and get on there and say, my name is Grandma Claire, and I want you to know that I'm praying for you and I love you. I don't know who you are, but I want you to know that God loves you. You know how many testimonies I heard like that? This man one day, he was home and he said, God, I want to do something for you. I want to do something for you. I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of just sitting in the pew not doing anything. God, I want to do something for you. God said, so get the phone book. He said, what? He said, get the phone book. So he went and got the phone book. He said, open it. So he opened it. He said, close your eyes. Close his eyes. He says, now put your finger on the name. Okay. This is a true story. He said, call him. Okay, Lord. Call. He said, now what am I going to do, Lord? He said, sing. Sing, he said, Yeah, when a man answers the phone, just start singing. Man answers, Hello, Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are we, but he's I don't know if that was a song, but I'm just giving it to you. I, I don't remember the song, but I'm gonna give you a song, right? Whatever the song was, the man said. Can you hold on a minute? He went and got his wife. He said, can you sing that again? Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. He said, who is this? And he told them who he was. They said, why did you call us? Why did you call at this time right now? He said, because the Spirit of the Lord 
told me to call and sing to you. He said, why? He said, can we come to your church? He said, yes. He says, uh, uh, you have a right? He said, we have a right. He says, just tell me the name of the church, where it is. I'll be, we'll be there. He says, uh, well, I hope that helped you. He says, helped us? He said, my wife and I were ready to commit suicide. We were just going to have a drink of poison together and die. But I want to come to your church. I want to know this Jesus that you have. Come on, somebody. How did he know what? Not, well, let me tell you. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Next verse, please. Just give me another. Who give me five minutes? Somebody who? How many give me five minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. I got 35 more minutes. For one is given the spirit, the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge. I had a word of knowledge one time for Rebecca. She came to me, oh, Pastor, my stomach, oh, I'm telling you, I'm having pain in my stomach. So much pain in my stomach. Lord gave me a word of knowledge. I says, stop eating salad. I think she turned around and laughed and went back to her seat. She says, I love salad. I ain't stopping when eating salad. So she didn't stop eating salad, so she still had pain. But then she came to the conclusion and said, what if he's right? And it wasn't me that was right. And you stopped eating salad, right? And what happened? That's a word of knowledge. I'm not a doctor. Well, I'm a doctor, but not that kind of doctor. But it's by the same spirit. Every single one of you in this place, you have a gift and you've been sitting on your gift long and it's not just music I'm talking about from these gifts next verse to another faith by the same spirit to another faith one example I have of that is um, R.W. Schambach anybody remember R.W. Schambach if you don't know who R.W. Schambach is, go on uh, YouTube and type in R.W. Schambach and listen to one of his men. He was a wild evangelist. I went to one of his tent meetings, and believe me, the power of God was there to heal and deliver and all that thing. To another faith by the same spirit. So he was looking for a building for his church. Turn that off, thank you. And so he was looking for a building for his church, and he saw a building for sale. The Spirit of the Lord said to him, that's your building. So he went over to the building, and he saw the for sale sign. He yanked it off the building, put it in his truck. Went to the real estate person and said, hey, you got a building on so-and-so over there? He said, yeah. He said, that's my building. He said, oh, you want to buy it? He said, no, God's going to give it to me. He said, that's my building. He says, don't sell it. That's my building. He said, I took the sign down. He said, you did what? He said, give me that, that sign. He said, do you have any money? He said, no. He said, well, how is it your building? You don't have no money. He says, God told me it's my building. So he's driving a couple of days later. He goes back, sees the sign again. He goes over there, takes the sign down. He goes back to the real estate guy and says, listen, I told you, don't put that sign up. That's my building. What do you mean that's your building? He said, that's my building. God told me that's my building. Long story short, so one day he's having his crusade and this woman comes in, goes down for healing, God heals her. She's jumping and shouting, praising God, I'm healed, I'm healed, praise God, I'm healed. She goes home. In the meantime, you go, Sean Back's driving back through that little town and there's this building with the sign on it. He goes back there, rips the sign down, puts it in the back of his truck, so that's it. He goes over to the thing, he says, listen. He says, I want you to call the owner of this building. You give him the sign. He says, God said, that's my building. What happened? He calls the owner. He says, he said, sir, he says, I, I hate to bother you, but I got, I got this guy. I don't think he's in his right mind. Uh, he's saying that 
God told them that the building you have for sale over here is his and that God said he's going to give it, he's, you're going to give it to him. He said, what? He said, what's that preacher's name? He says, R.W. Shambach. What? R.W. Shambach? He said, hold on a minute. He said, honey, what was the name of that preacher you went to see the other night? And he healed, and God healed you through him. What's, what was his name? She says, R.W. Shambach. He said, wait a minute, I'll be right over. He goes down to the real estate place, and he says, you're the man that did that, and my wife is totally healed now? He said, here's the keys. The building's yours. Free. Gift of faith. Okay? Now, I don't want you to go to a new car dealership and start sitting on the car saying that's mine. <laughs> Unless God tells you <laughs> that it's yours. All right? Next one. Come on. Oh, no, go back. I, I, forgot, the, I forgot one. I forgot one. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. How many times God healed you? Amen. We've seen healings in this church. Amen. God is good. He's a, he's a healer. Some of you have that gift. And you're sitting on it. Sometimes God told you, go pray for that person. I ain't going to pray for that person. You know who suffers? That person and you. Because you're quenching the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. By the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. Miracles. Would you say someone being raised from the dead is a miracle? Oh, absolutely. No? David, Di David Diamond is in Kutulata, Africa. I believe that's the, how you pronounce it. I don't know how you pronounce it. And he was in Africa, deep, deep part of the jungle. <clears throat> and he, you know, was getting ready to preach and all that stuff. And he preached and all that. And after that, someone said, can you come to the village? Men of God, come. So he went, and they, they went into this little hut. And there was an elderly woman with a sheet over her. And they said, our sister has died. Could you pray for her? Now, some of you would have said, well, she's dead already, so I know she's praying for the dead. He said, sure. And he went to go pray for her in the spirit of the Lord, working of a miracle, Gift of knowledge. He said, wait a minute. He said, before the sun comes over the banana tree, tomorrow she shall live again. And he turned around and walked out. So the people from the town came, the, you know, the chiefs and all that came to take the body, to put it in the grave. And this elderly woman that was sitting there, she said, please, no, no, no. Let her stay one more day. Man of God came. Said, before sun go up on banana tree, she shall live again. Let's see what God will do. And they agreed, so they left. The next morning, here comes the sun. When that sun hit the banana leaf trees, that woman popped right up. Took the sheet off. That whole village went nuts. Many, many, many people got saved. That's a miracle. Miracles still happen today. Just don't be deceived with the false miracles that the Antichrist is going to bring. But there are true miracles. Wherever it is the truth, there's a, there's a lie. How many believe that? I believe that. Right? You believe there's real money? Isn't it counterfeit money? Right? Somebody came along and made a counterfeit. It's the same way. You have the original and then you have a counterfeit. You just got to know the difference. You got to have discernment. To another working of miracles. To another prophecy. Some of you got the gift of prophecy. Sometimes someone would be speaking in tongues. Right? 
And you got the gift of prophecy, the interpretation of it. Somebody speak in tongues, then it's all quiet. And you sit there going, is it me, Lord? Is it me, Lord? Is it me? Is it me, Lord? Is it me? Lord, I don't know if it's me or you. I don't know. By the time you do that, you talk yourself out of exercising your gift. Just do it. Give it. If there's anything that's not right in it, we'll just straighten it out. No big deal. No one's going to bite your head off. To another, discerning of spirits. Mm Mm-hmm. Discerning of spirits. Don't do that. The Lord showed me not to do that. Do you know there were people that were Christians on September 11th, 2001, 2000? Was it 2000 when 9-11 happened? Right? There were Christians that were going to go to the towers to work, and God told them, don't go. And they discerned something wasn't right, and they didn't go, and those towers fell, they would have been killed. Listen when God tells you no. When God tells you no, it's for a reason. He wants to protect you. He loves you. Don't always think like he's trying to hold stuff back on you from having fun. He's not. But he's trying to tell you to just listen and discern. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Next verse. I'm going to finish real quick. But all these worketh that one and self same spirit, dividing to only a few. Is that what it says? What does it say? Dividing to every man severally as he will. So my question this morning is, what is the church? Is it a little building that you just come to? Get fed? Get fat? Spiritually, I'm talking about. And then go home. And then you don't call anybody for the rest of the week. You don't talk to anybody in the church during the rest of the week. Is that what the church is? That was weak. Is that what the church is? It's to be involved with one another's lives, to uplift and to build up one another. As Ephesians says, all the stones fitly framed together, edifying one another. It's not just the pastor's job to edify you. If you haven't seen somebody in church, call them. Edify them. Pray with them. Get involved in people's lives. Just don't get so inclusive to your own life that you neglect what God has given you. Use the gifts that God's given you. And if you don't say, you say, well, well, Pastor, you know, I really don't know what my gift is. Come down to the altar. The Bible says desire spiritual gifts. Do you desire it? I know when I desire ice cream, My wife tells me, do you want ice cream? She don't have to ask me twice. Oh, yeah, baby. Bring it on. Okay? When you desire, you fulfill that desire. He says, desire spiritual gifts. Because each and every one of you have talents and gifts. And let me tell you something. If you were to take these gifts, and once you know your gift, and seek the Lord and ask him, what's my gift, Lord? And once you find out what your gift is, Begin to use it, not only in the church, but out there. Do you know that, I'll just close with this. There was an unsaved guy that I used to work with in Rhode Island. And he, he, was, he was a little, maybe like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, bald-headed guy, very hairy. I mean, very hairy. Had hair that stuck outside the collar, you know, it's that kind of hairy person. I'm not trying to be gross, but that's what he was. It was very so he wore a short sleeve shirt and his hair's, you know, his hair's about this long on his arms and all. And he used to he used to like make fun of the wrestler uh, George the Animal Steel. Remember George the Animal Steel? Hey, you, 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 hey. He used to do all that saying, make people laugh all the time and all that stuff. I mean, he used to crack jokes and you know, come walking and hey, you, hey, you know, and we'd all laugh. And one day the Lord spoke to me and said, tell him this. And I said, Al, come here. Came over. I said, you know, you're a funny man, man. You make everybody laugh. 
But can I tell you something that God told me to tell you? He wasn't a Christian. He said, God told you to tell me something? I said, yeah. <laughs> what is it? I said, you make people laugh all the time, but inside you're crying. His eyes begin to well up. Tears streaming down his face. He said, how did you know that? He says, I want to know how you knew that. I said, because the Spirit of the Lord is real. And he wants you to know that he loves you. And it opened the door for me to speak with him about Christ. Because there are a lot of hurting people. There's a lot of, hi, how are you? You know, hi, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? Oh, good to see you. Yeah, yeah. But inside, they're hurting. And what you need to do is make sure that God gives you a gift, that you use that gift to reach to people. Let me tell you something. Gang members out there, you know why they join a gang? Because they're trying to fulfill something that's missing. They have a camaraderie. They have a unit, someone they seemingly cares about them. So they join this gang because they've been hurt either by their mother or the father's gone or they don't have nobody that can give them structure or they just don't know how to listen or behave. They need somebody to love them. And all you need to do is just share the love of Jesus with them. Go and pray for them. These homeless people that are out there, you know, we all struggle. Man, ah, that's just a bunch of low lives. They don't want to do nothing. They just want to stand there and collect money. That may be true. But how about just one day, instead of giving them money, just go up to them with a sandwich and a coffee. You don't ever say you, you don't know what to do. You can do anything. Just go up to them. Give them a coffee. Give them a donut. Give them something. Say, hey, I just felt to buy you this. Well, why'd you buy me that? Because Jesus loves you. Can I tell you, that can change a person's life. Don't be so stagnated as a Christian where you don't win anybody to Christ. When's the last time you won somebody to Christ? Ask God what your gift is. Move in operation in faith with that gift and watch what God will do. Amen? Let's all stand in closing. Father, we thank you and praise you that the church isn't just a building, but Lord, it's a place to come and get recharged. It's a place to come and get renewed and strengthened and encouraged. Father, I pray that your gifts would begin to manifest in this church 